So hello there and welcome to another tutorial. My name is Tammy Bakshi and today we're going to be going over how you can build your own LLVM function passes to modify your code at compile time using the LLVM compiler infrastructure tooling. Uh, now this is a follow-up video to my existing video on the LLVM compiler infrastructure once again. If you'd like to learn more about what LLVM is, why it exists, what it enables you to do, please do check out that first video. But if you're already familiar with what LLVM is and you want to get started actually building your own function passes and your own extensions to the compiler, then this video is for you. Now, before I do get into this, I do want to start off by saying that if you enjoy this kind of content and you want to see more of it, please do make sure to subscribe to the channel as it really does help out a lot and turn on notifications so you're notified whenever I release videos like this one today. Apart from that, like the video if you enjoyed it and if you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, leave it down in the comments section below and I'd love uh, to get in touch. Now diving right into what we have uh, to show today. Once again, LLVM, just as a quick recap, is, as I've said before, compiler infrastructure. So say, for example, you're developing a Swift compiler or a Rust compiler or a C compiler, pretty much any language. Instead of building the entire compiler yourself, taking all the way from your high-level code, creating an abstract syntax tree, uh, creating an intermediate representation, then finally exporting machine code, instead of having to go through that entire pipeline, you can actually skip the entire back-end portion by using LLVM. What it enables you to do is take your language, effectively translate it into one sort of universal yet very low-level representation, which they call LLVM IR, intermediate representation, and then pass that over to the LLVM compiler. The LLVM compiler will then go ahead and take your intermediate representation, run a bunch of industry standard optimizations on it, um, and then go ahead and export for you machine code to a variety of different architectures, all the way from x86 and ARM to Power and IBM Z, and so much more. Now, LLVM is super useful because it enables things like, for example, code reuse, right? So one language like Swift, for example, thinks of an incredible optimization for code. Well, them implementing that optimization into the LLVM IR stack suddenly benefits a lot of other languages as well. And because of this, code is a lot more portable too. Like, for example, Rust, right? Rust has two other intermediate representations before it goes to LLVM that are Rust-specific, enabling it to do Rust-specific optimization. But it still lowers down to an LLVM layer where it can then be compiled to any of the target architectures that LLVM already supports. This makes it so it's a lot easier for developers on the compiler team to support tons of architectures without a ton more work. Now, what, uh, the, the way that LLVM works, right, the, the way this sort of architecture is, uh, is there are individual what they call passes that LLVM will run on your IR during the compilation phase. So, for example, if you wrote C code and you're compiling with Clang and you use dash O fast, it'll use pretty much every optimization it can, right? So you're telling Clang, hey, use the highest optimization level possible. What that's doing is it's telling LLVM, hey, of all the different function passes and module passes that you have, there's even more like loop passes, run them all on this code, not necessarily all of them, but a lot of them on this code to modify it in such a way that we believe would make it faster, right? So for example, some passes could be responsible for uh, taking a function call to a very small function and inlining the function content, right? That would be a function pass. You're looking at functions that are being called, seeing if you have the available code for it, and if you do, inlining that call. Another thing might be, for example, a loop pass to be able to fuse together multiple different loops in order to avoid extra branching and instructions, right? So these passes are responsible for taking your IR, analyzing Optimizing them, trying to find patterns that they believe would be slow, and optimizing them by introducing different sets of code that should have the exact same behavior and result, but should be able to do it in a more efficient manner. That's the point of these passes. Now, not all passes have to be optimization passes. Some passes, for example, can be for analytics or for you to insert instrumentation into your code. And as an example today, I want to show you how you can build a function pass that will enable you to insert effectively arbitrary code into any function, except this specific function pass will take every function, and every single time a function enters, it'll insert a print statement printing out the name of the function that just entered, and it'll also print a number of how many times that function has been called in this specific invocation of the program. So let's go ahead and take a look at how you would do that. Um, as you can see over here, 
I've got my terminal window open, um, and we, we, I've just opened up a simple Docker container. I've already installed LLVM. It's a reasonably straightforward procedure to do so, especially on Linux. So there will be a link to the description, a link in the description down below, um, to the LLVM compiler tooling and how you can get started, uh, by installing it, uh, and sort of getting a, a development environment ready and set up. Uh, I built it from source personally since I found it easier to install that way, but there are other ways to install pre-built versions as well. Now, in this directory, I've got a pretty simple C++ file open up here. Um, and the C++ file is what's going to enable us um, to run our function pass. This is the source code for the LLVM function pass that I was talking about. Um, it's actually not too bad. Um, and it's sort of split up into a couple of main sections. The first one is our initialization. So literally just, you know, simple includes and using namespaces. Um, then, of course, is the actual function pass. Sort of, you know, what you really need to worry about is lines 20 through 45. And then after those lines uh, are the lines that we use to register the function pass with LLVM to tell it how to invoke this function pass. Um, I'll get into sort of the structure of this code in just a moment. Really quickly though, to begin, I do want to sort of prime you to what you're about to read uh, before we actually dig into it. Now, as I've taught uh, different people how to work with LLVM and honestly, even other compilers or even interpreters like the Python interpreters, uh, Python interpreter, I've noticed that one sort of common thread that is kind of confusing when you're starting to work with this technology is that you have to really keep in mind that you are not necessarily just writing code here. You are writing code that is responsible for writing code. That's a very important distinction to keep in mind, right? Like, for example, as I was explaining the global interpreter lock to, um, uh, to, to, to someone who had the question uh, in, 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 in Python, which, by the way, is effectively a mutex that makes it so that the Python interpreter can only ever run one thread at a time. So in Python, multi-threading is technically, I mean, multi-threading, but you're only ever running a single thread at once. Anyway, that's a different discussion. You know, it, it's sort of hard to understand, um, from a high level at least, why these things are necessary before you really think about the fact that you're talking about programs that are responsible for executing or writing other programs, right? So as you're looking at this LLVM function pass here, really keep in mind that what we're doing here is we are writing code to write code, right? So for example, if I say we are inserting a function call, I don't mean we're actually calling a function. We are writing instructions. We are calling LLVM API functions that are responsible for inserting an actual function call instruction into code that we'll be compiling later on that uses this plugin, right? That's really important to keep in mind. Now, heading back over to the actual uh, function pass here. As I mentioned, we start off with some simple initialization. So we have some simple includes. Um, and, and also, by the way, this is C++ code, but you can write LLVM code in other languages as well. There are bindings for languages like Swift, and I believe also safe bindings for languages like Rust, in case you're into that, um, if you'd like. I can also work on a YouTube sort of video series on building some more of these, uh, more of these like LLVM passes in languages like Rust that I think would be a lot more fun. So let me know if you'd like to see those tutorials. Now, moving forward from here, again, simple C++ stuff using the two namespaces, LLVM and STD that we're going to need. Um, and this is where the fun part starts. Uh, now we get to actually create the function pass. Now, what we're doing here is creating a simple structure called runtime print function call count pass. Rolls right out the tongue. Um, and it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's derived from uh, the function pass uh, that comes from the LLVM API. So function pass comes from LLVM. We're saying that this uh, structure sort of inherits from function pass. We create a super simple initializer um, that literally just takes an ID. Uh, this initializer is never called by you, right? You never initialize this structure yourself. Um, that's done by LLVM when it's invoking your function pass, which is why we're just sort of following boilerplate here effectively. Um, next is a function that you're supposed to sort of like overload here. Uh, it's called run on function. Now the run on function function, uh, again, kind of difficult to keep track of, uh, you know, what exactly here is code that we're writing versus code that's being invoked. But the run on function function is a function that will be run on every function in your LLVM module. So what this means is when you're compiling, for example, a C file with Clang, 
and you tell Clang to use your function pass, it will internally take every LLVM IR function, pass that as an object to run on function within your pass, right? So this takes a function. This is not like an actual function pointer. You can't actually call this. This is not fully compiled. It is an object that contains the LLVM IR for what you are currently compiling, right? This is not an actual function loaded into executable memory. This is a sequence of LLVM IR instructions in an object that you can now mutate or analyze however you wish. Um, now, what this function does to start off with is we simply get the LLVM context that we're dealing with, and this gives us like compile information, and then we go ahead and um, take a look at what module we're in, right? So we want to figure out, you know, this this LLVM function that that we've been passed. What is the larger module that it's a part of? Uh, which effectively you could think of as the file of code that you're compiling um, using LLVM. The next thing that we do is we start initializing a couple of variables that are necessary for what we actually want to insert. Remember, we want to insert into the beginning of every function a call to printf to make it print what function has just been called and also how many times it's been called. In order to do so, we need to know the signature of the printf function. Uh, to get that signature is kind of complicated. So like in an actual C file, what you would do is you would, you would probably just include stdio.h. But if you didn't want to use that header, you would actually write a function signature, uh, something like uh, int um, printf const car um, str like so. Um, and then it takes like bariatic arguments like so, right? So you, you would write something like this um, in your, uh, in, in, in like a header file somewhere in order to tell C that, hey, somewhere there's going to be a, a function called printf and you know, your linker can deal with it later. Um, but the problem is that we're not actually writing that C code right now. We are writing LLVM code um, that needs to, or rather we are using the LLVM API to write LLVM IR code. So what we have to do is we have to formally create a function type object from the LLVM API, tell it that the return type is an integer 32 type also coming from the LLVM API, and the only argument is an 8-bit integer pointer type. Um, this means the character pointer because characters are 8-bit integers. Um, and of course, true here means that this is a variadic function. It takes, you know, an arbitrary number of arguments after the ones that have already been specified in this set. Once we've got that function type, we actually go ahead and sort of create that signature with a name, right? So this over here uh, is telling the module to either get or insert a function named printf of this type. So what that's going to do is if a signature for this already exists within the module, you'll be returned this function callee object that allows you to insert, like, for example, function calls to this function callee. Um, or if it doesn't exist, it will be inserted into the module and then passed back to you. Uh, and that is what enables you to figure out what printf is and how to call it. Next thing we got to do is actually start inserting code. Um, now, once again, the entire point of this is that we want to print out the name of the functions. Now, the way we're going to do this is by starting out um, by actually getting the name of the function. So we get the LLVM function's name using get name. This gives us a special type called, called an LLVM twine, which we then convert to an actual C++ string just to make it easier to deal with. Uh, and then I also create a new string, which is a function name, with underscore call count appended to it. The reason we're doing this is because another thing we want this pass to do is keep track of how many times each function's been called. The way I do this is by using a global variable called function name underscore call count. By default, we set it to zero, and every single time a function's called, it's incremented before being printed. And so what we then go ahead and do is tell the module to get a global variable with the name function name plus function call variable name. Uh, now, here's the thing. Unlike this line over here, if the global variable doesn't already exist, 
it's not going to be inserted. And so if this is a null pointer, if this doesn't return to us an actual global variable, we need to go ahead and create this global variable and then um, use it uh, from there. So what we do is if this is a null pointer, we create a new global variable class instance. We pass it the module that we're a part of so it knows where to insert the global variable. We tell it that it needs to be a 32-bit integer type. We go ahead and give it common linkage, we give it a default static initializer value of zero, and we give it the correct name. Now that I think about it, technically since we're already appending call count, we don't need to be doing it here once again. We also then go ahead and once again set the initializer of function call count uh, to a constant integer of zero. Right? So we're just making sure that this value is set to zero by default. Now, after we've gone ahead and created that global variable, we can go ahead and actually start inserting some code. This is the fun part. So the first thing we do is, I mean, functions being effectively collections of instructions are iterators in C++. And so what we can do is go ahead and take a reference to the function that we've been passed and get the front, which is the first you know, thing in the iterator, so get the first thing in the iterator, and get the first thing from that, because what it returns to us is also an iterator. Why is that? Well, once again, it's because LLVM code is built up of basic blocks. So you've got functions that consist of effectively an iterator of basic blocks. Each basic block is an iterator of instructions. So what this is doing is it's getting the first basic block from the function, and from the first basic block, we get the first instruction. This is the first instruction that is executed on the entry point to the function. We then go ahead and create an IR builder instance on top of this first instruction, enabling us to insert code just before this first instruction. Now, what code do we want to insert, you may ask? Well, pretty simple. We got to do a load add store operation. What we have to do is we have to load the global variable that we created in the LLVM module, because if you think about it, global variables kind of need to be pointers. It doesn't really make all that much sense for there to be a global variable here that isn't a pointer. So we have to load that pointer value um, from the global variable. Once we've loaded it, uh, we can go ahead and add one to that sort of local register value within the function, right? So we've loaded that memory address into the function into a local register. We can add one to um, that, that loaded value locally. And then we can go ahead and store that new register value um, into the global variables memory address. So once again, LLVMIR is in SSA single static assignment form. So we can't just say, you know, set the previous register to itself plus one, we have to create a new add instruction um, that will run the add and give us a new value register um, that we will then go ahead and store in the memory in the existing memory address that we have for the global variable. Now, even though LLVM obviously has this infinite register architecture, CPUs don't, and so LLVM code is heavily optimized away when being translated to actual machine code. Um, values aren't just kept around for no reason there you know, gotten rid of when you don't need them anymore. That's sort of the advantage of the SSA format is it's very easy to determine these things. Uh, then all we got to do uh, is, is sort of figure out what string it is that we want printf to actually print. And in this case, what I want it to print is the function name plus, uh, or plus a space, um, and then the percent D, which is the format specifier for a 32-bit integer, and then a new line character. The reason we want to do that is because the way we're going to invoke printf is with the number of calls as a separate argument, so that we only need one string string um, for to, to invoke printf with and then from there we can just pass different arguments to printf in order to get it to print the different strings based off of the call count. So I then go ahead and take this string of the function name plus the format specifier, create another global variable out of that string, and then we create a call instruction to the printf function that we created up here on line 24. Um, and we pass it two parameters. We pass it the pointer to the string that contains, you know, what it is that we want printf to print, of course, and then the added call count, which is this register over here that we're reusing after we used it for a store operation um, in order to uh, get it to print the call count after it's been incremented. So we don't need to do another load. We can just use the added value that we had then stored into the global variables memory address. 
Now from there, of course, there's just some pretty simple registration code. Effectively, what this is doing is it's telling LLVM how to call the function pass and the fact that it's sort of registering the fact that it exists, right? So for example, calling it to register pass with the structure that we created uh, and, and some parameters here enables it to understand how to call the function pass. In particular, this argument, for example, is the actual command line flag you would need to pass to Clang in order to invoke this function pass. If you were to not pass dash RPFCC to Clang when compiling, it wouldn't actually use the function pass that you just built. So let's go ahead and take a look at what it looks like to actually use it. So the first thing I can do uh, is go ahead and compile the actual function pass. So all this is going to do is it's going to take the C++ code, compile it, uh, and export it to a shared library. Now this shared library is something that you want to pass to Clang or technically to LLVM when it's compiling your code alongside the dash RPFCC flag. And what that's going to do is when LLVM is compiling, it's going to load this shared library. The static registration code at the end is going to execute telling LLVM that it exists. And then when LLVM sees your command line flag eventually, it'll go back and realize that, hey, this flag is associated with this function pass, and it will make sure that it's invoked at the right time. Um, and how convenient, I've also got a little piece of example code here for us to check out. This example code is very much a classic. It's a simple factorial function. Uh, that enables us uh, to see how many times, the and, and when we run this, we'll be able to see how many times factorial and main are called. All we're doing with this code is printing the factorial of five recursively. It's not particularly complex. Um, if I were to compile this normally, which of course is possible, um, we'll just see 120, which is indeed five factorial. So as you can see, that does work. Now I've got a bit of a build script ready here, and the build script really just has three steps. The first one is to take factorial.c and compile it to another file called factorial.ll. LL is the file extension for LLVM IR code, and if we take a look at it, we can actually see what LLVM IR the C code translates to. As you can see, it's kind of understandable and readable as to what it's trying to do, but it's very clearly not high level, right? It still does require some analysis to really understand what's going on. But overall, it's better than assembly, and it's not architecture specific, so that's a plus. Now, what we want to do is we somehow want to modify this LLVM IR code um, using the LLVM opt utility. What we're going to do is we're going to tell the opt utility to load this, um, this shared library that we compiled our function pass into, and then we're going to pass it the flag to actually invoke that pass. And we're going to pass it factorial.ll and tell it to once again output LLVM IR uh, to a new file called factorial opt.ll. Now, if we take a look at this code, as you can see, there have been some modifications completely automatically. Some of these modifications include the addition of these four global variables. Factorial call count, which is how many times the factorial function has been called. Main call count, which is the same thing but for main. As well as these two unnamed global variables, 0 and 1, that are used as the actual format strings for printf to know how to print the names of factorial and main, as well as their call counts. As you can see in the sort of beginning of the factorial function, we've added four instructions. We've added a load of the global call count variable, an add to it, a store back to it, and a call to printf to tell it to actually do what we want it to do, print the function call. Uh, from there, we also see very similar additions to the main function. And that is what our function pass just did. If I were to go ahead and quit here, I can now run this final clang command to take the LLVM IR and output an actual binary from it, and theoretically, we should see the following printed out. With the exact same C code, with no code modifications to the actual original source, we're now getting it to do something different. In this case, it was a very simple function pass that enabled us to print out a function name and what iteration it's on, how many times it has been called up until that point. As you can see, because we're calculating the factorial of five, it goes up to five for factorial since it's recursive. However, what's 
beautiful about this technique is that you can do whatever you want, right? It doesn't even need to modify the code. You could do, you know, static analysis of your code at compile time and just log out stats. You could log out um, information that helps you later determine code coverage of your tests. You could insert code that helps you instrument how long functions take to run. You could insert uh, code that does quite literally anything you wanted to at compile time. And because it's LLVM based, it works across a variety of different languages, right? One LLVM function pass has the opportunity to work across Swift, Rust, Julia, C, C++, Fortran, and even more code, right? And I mean, technically some can require a few more tweaks. Like for example, some libraries will compile one of your functions to multiple LLVM functions, or they'll just make longer or more messed up functions in a way in LLVM, but it is still possible, right? With very little tweaking across languages. And that is what's so beautiful about the LLVM infrastructure and is why I am so passionate about not only compilers in general, but particularly how to use this tooling, because I believe it is the best way to be able to build compilers for the future in a way that is scalable and enables sharing of resources and ideas across so many different communities. It is honestly pretty fascinating to see. And that is how you build simple LLVM function passes in C++. Once again, I do hope you enjoyed. If you did, please do make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications. And of course, once again, any questions, suggestions, or feedback, please do leave it down in the comment section below. I would love to hear from you. If you'd like to see more tutorials on LLVM, how to build your own passes, if you have any particular ideas of things you'd like to see me build, or if you'd like me to go ahead and build similar things in other languages like Rust or Swift, let me know and I will get on that. But once again, thank you. Thank you very much for joining today and goodbye.